Funding for NJ Spotlight News provided by the members of the New Jersey Education Association, making public schools great for every child. RWJ Barnabas Health, let's be healthy together. And the Ocean Wind Project by Orsted and PSEG, committed to the creation of a new long-term sustainable clean energy future for New Jersey. From NJPBS, this is NJ Spotlight News with Brianna Venosi. Good evening and thank you for joining us. I'm Rhonda Schaffler. Brianna Venosi is off tonight. State lawmakers voted late today to end the governor's series of public health emergency orders. The bill, which was passed by the Assembly Appropriations Committee, would instead give Governor Murphy broad powers to guide the coronavirus pandemic response. The move comes as some big changes are coming tomorrow as the state continues to roll back coronavirus-related restrictions. New Jersey's 50% indoor capacity limits will be lifted for a wide variety of businesses, restaurants, gyms, salons, movie theaters, museums, and houses of worship. Social distancing rules will still be in effect as will indoor mask wearing, even as our neighboring states will allow vaccinated people to shed their masks indoors. Making New Jersey the only Northeast state to keep the mandate in place, at least for a couple more weeks, according to the governor, as the majority of residents remain unvaccinated. Today, the state crossed 3.9 million fully vaccinated residents but shots still lag in some of the most vulnerable communities. The Johnson & Johnson vaccine was touted by the Murphy administration as a way to access some of those hard to reach neighborhoods. But confidence in the vaccine appears to be lagging after another 13 blood clots were recently reported in connection with the shot, even after the CDC lifted a pause on the vaccine last month. Senior correspondent Brenda Flanagan reports. I'm getting the J&J. &J. Rich Godleski's among very few clients who opted for J&J's COVID vaccine today at Vanguard Medical's vaccination drive through clinic in Verona. Workers popped shots into more than 300 motorists and clients could choose from amongst all three available vaccines. More than half picked Moderna, about 100 chose Pfizer, only five wanted J&J, &J, despite its connection to a rare but serious blood clot complication. Only because it's a one shot deal, I don't have to keep coming back for a second and maybe boosters down the road and all that kind of stuff, you know? You know what? They're not really sure about what anything will do in the long term. But Shelley Solm did consider the odds. The CDC notes out of millions vaccinated, 28 patients develop blood clots after taking the J&J &J vaccine, all adults between the ages of 18 and 59. All but six were in women and three have died. The health agency ruled the J&J &J vaccine's benefits outweighed its minimal risks. I only wanted to get one shot and I'm not in the risk of that very small risk group, the age of that very small risk group. So just decided to do this one. We're talking about a very rare event that, you know, that people need to look at in proportion to its frequency. Rutgers Dr. Martin Blazer says people should decide based on their individual needs. In general, if all things were equal for women under 50, I would say get the two two shot vaccines. But sometimes all things aren't equal. It's uh, people have work schedules, they have family responsibilities. Sometimes it's better just to get the one shot and be done with it. Out of 3.9 million fully vaccinated New Jersey residents, only 8% took the J&J &J shot. That's fewer than 300,000. But its 10-day suspension while experts examine the clotting issue apparently caused lingering damage in the eyes of many here who still feel unsure about J&J. &J. I thought about it, and then there was complications I heard in the news, so I decided not to. I just don't feel like it's trusted enough. Yeah, just for my own safety. Initially, the demand was much higher for the J&J &J vaccine. Vanguard's Nally Kernison explained they scheduled J&J &J in blocks of five, the number of doses in each vial, to avoid wastage. And I think in light of the recent um, 
uh, rare side effect of blood clots seen in the setting of low blood platelets, people are a little bit le uh, more hesitant about receiving the J&J &J vaccine. The numbers here tend to match a recent survey showing more people are opting for the two-dose vaccines over J&J. &J. The study showed less than half of those who replied, 46% felt at least somewhat confident in the safety of J&J's COVID vaccine, compared to nearly 70% who felt some confidence in Pfizer and Moderna. Vaccination rates move in waves, with the latest surge involving kids 12 to 15 years old rushing to take the only vaccine approved for their age group, Pfizer. But the J&J &J vaccine still appeals to certain folks, Vanguard Executive Director Katherine Fowler says. If you're getting ready to go on a vacation, or you've got a relative that you want to go see or something like that, sometimes that makes more sense. J&J &J was 72% effective in U.S. clinical trials. It travels more easily, which works better for outreach efforts using visiting nurses and mobile clinics. So far, 12% of all fully vaccinated U.S. adults got the J&J &J vaccine. That's 9.7 million shots nationwide. But manufacturing problems have also plagued J&J, &J, and the federal government scheduled to deliver zero doses of J&J &J to states this week. Vanguard hopes to get more. There may be an association with the vaccine really only being for elderly patients, but it's an option that we believe is good for everyone and also in helping us achieve herd immunity. I'm Brenda Flanagan, NJ Spotlight News. Even with that drop in Johnson & Johnson vaccines, state leaders say we're seeing health metrics trending in the right direction. 578 new COVID cases were reported today and 24 more fatalities. We haven't seen case numbers this low since last October. Governor Murphy says with cases trending down and vaccines now available to children as young as 12, it's time to get kids back to the classrooms full time this fall. Right now, most schools are either fully in person or on a hybrid schedule. Just five public school districts remain all remote, but by the fall, that option will be gone. Murphy is requiring all schools to provide full day in-person instruction, just like they did before the pandemic some 14 months ago. I asked NJ Spotlight's founding editor and education writer, John Mooney, if school districts are ready. John, what are some of the concerns New Jersey school districts have as they prepare for the fall reopening? Well, I mean, it's just a lot of question marks. Um, a, a big one is is whether kids and, and teachers will all come back uh, at the no, at the numbers they've come back in the past. And I know Governor Murphy said that they all must come back, um, but there's you know there's going to be exceptions. There's going to be some tensions over that. Um, are the buildings ready to you know to be able to meet some of the capacity demands that have shifted uh, with the pandemic? Uh, I mean, it, it is a, a fraught time. Uh, this is going to be a, a school opening like no other before. Uh, and kids are going to be in a totally different place than they were when the last time they were in those buildings, uh, at least on a full-time basis. So there's there's lots of questions, but there's also some time. I mean, they're, they're now working on it. Uh, this was not a surprise to school districts. They were already planning on, on full openings next fall. Uh, and, and those discussions are happening right now. John, what if there's just reluctance from both teachers and parents who might still be nervous? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's gonna, it, it, it's gonna put superintendents and principals in an enforcement position. Uh, they're gonna wave you know, the order from the governor saying things are back to where we have compulsory education and you have to come. Um, but this is different than those times. And uh, you know, we'll see, it, I, I, have, I have a feeling and I've, you know, I've stopped trying to predict these things, but I have a feeling that that folks are going to be clamoring to come back to school. Uh, and I think it's, you know, by that point, uh, they'll just be, you know, knocking at the door. Um, will there be exceptions? Certainly. And the big wild card, of course, is what happens with the pandemic and, and the virus itself and, and whether that rears itself, uh, even with small outbreaks. And that's going to change some of the equation as well. You know, John, I'm curious, do you think there are going to be lasting changes in New Jersey school districts based on lessons learned over this past year, even if everyone is there together? What did they learn that they can bring forward? Yeah, I mean, that's a very good question. And certainly, um, I would hope there's going to be some lasting changes. There's certainly, this has laid bare some issues uh, and some inequities in our system. Uh, so certainly, I do think that there'll be more use of technology. Uh, we're going to be at a point where every kid should have full access to that technology. 
Uh, certainly the, the use of remote learning, I think is gonna be something that's more comfortable to a lot of districts, not so much the whole school, but kids who need you know, the instruction at home or um, the, you know, taking that course that isn't available necessarily at the school. I think you'll start seeing that, but I think there's also gonna be such a clamoring to get back to you know, the old normal um, that it may take a little longer to get to the new normal in that sense. John, we should also touch on the issue of home rule. What happens there? Well, I mean, uh, it, it ultimately is up to these districts to decide what they're going to do. And uh, it's interesting that the, the governor who really deferred to home rule for a long time now is trying to put a little pressure on them. But home rule still wins in New Jersey. Uh, we know that. And I don't think this will be an exception to that. John Mooney, thank you. Good to see you. Meantime, the New Jersey State Interscholastic Athletic Association says it will no longer require masks for outdoor high school sporting events now that the governor eliminated the outdoor mask mandate. The massive wildfire that broke out in Bass River State Forest over the weekend has now been contained. At one point, the 617-acre fire in Burlington County and parts of Little Egg Harbor threatened 100 homes but there were no reports of damaged structures and no injuries either. Smoke is expected to remain in the area for several days. Meantime, firefighters today are making progress containing another wildfire in Brendan T. Byrne State Forest in Pemberton. It broke out last night and it spread to more than 400 acres. All these years later, we are still tallying up the damage from Superstorm Sandy. And a new estimate finds that billions of dollars in damage from that storm can be tied to rising sea levels caused by carbon emissions. As part of our ongoing series on the human stories of climate change, peril and promise, senior correspondent David Cruz looks at the price we paid. It's been almost 10 years, but we're still learning things from Superstorm Sandy. A new report out today suggests that what made Sandy super was not simply the confluence of forces of nature, but significantly our impact on the forces of nature. The report, prepared by researchers from Climate Central based in Princeton, Stevens Institute and Rutgers University, estimates sea level rise of four inches between 1900 and 2012, specifically caused by us. How much additional damage did that cause? Um, it was on the order of about 12% uh, of the overall damage and around 70,000 people who would not have been exposed or not been damaged had it not been for those four inches caused by humans. For the last uh, you know, 200 years, we've been burning fossil fuels and putting carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. We've also been chopping down forests and changing land use in a way that puts CO2 in the atmosphere. We've also been putting things like methane in the atmosphere. And so all of those changes to the atmosphere lead to more heat being trapped. Which warms the planet, which warms the oceans, and well, you get it, right? The findings had environmentalists saying both, I told you so, and let's get going on solutions. The report's findings are clear that if you were to check the planet into the doctor's office, they would say, you're about to have a heart attack. And you know the report's findings are really unique because they are directly attributing a disaster we all know all too well from Hurricane Sandy and showing that a significant percentage of Sandy's impacts was because of man-made climate change. That is unique. That has not been quantified before. On the low end, almost 13% of the damage. On the high end, maybe 24% of the damage. Monetary damage on the low end, more than three and a half billion dollars. On the high end, could have been as much as seven billion dollars, directly attributable to the myriad of ways we are warming the earth. I think the biggest takeaway is that this report shows how vulnerable we are. And in some ways, we we're lucky it could have been worse. But what it did show is that for the first time, the storm really went into places that in other other times and other storms probably would not have been hit so bad or hit at all. The report doesn't make specific recommendations on how to get out of this spiral, but it's we have met the enemy and he is us theme is not falling on deaf ears with the people who might actually be able to do something about it. We're all in big trouble. We're in big, big trouble. And Smith is usually the optimist. 
The senator who chairs the Environment Committee says legislators and the governor's office are trying to do something. Half of the greenhouse gases that go into the air come from the transportation sec uh, sec section of our economy. So electrify everything. Let's have EVs for all of our citizens. Let's have electric uh, tractor trailer trucks for uh, the movement of our goods, electric trains. That's one of the things that we can do. The second thing that we have to do, we have to get off our addiction to fossil fuels, big time. Smith calls the state's electric vehicle incentive program, which provides rebates to those who buy EVs and set up charging stations at home, a good start. The state has also gone all in on offshore wind, with the governor setting a goal of 100% renewable energy in Jersey by 2050, roughly a generation away. That's optimism that, so far, we have been unable to refine into action. I'm David Cruz. NJ Spotlight News. Governor Phil Murphy scores well in a new Monmouth University Polling Institute survey of state residents. Half of the residents polled give the governor a favorable rating, while 34% give him an unfavorable rating. That is the highest rating of any recent governor. The least popular governor is Chris Christie, according to the poll. Only 26% of residents give him a favorable rating compared to 64% who rate him unfavorably. When asked what they remember most about Christie's eight years in office, one in four people said the Bridgegate scandal. Residents also said their favorite living ex-governor is Governor Tom Kane. New Jersey's budget outlook continues to improve according to the state treasury department. New Jersey is already on track for a $6.3 billion budget surplus and the revenue forecast could increase by hundreds of millions of dollars. And Chase Spotlight's John Reitmeyer explains how the Murphy administration went from predicting a possible budget shortfall last year to being flush with cash this year. It's really been a whole different story. The, the sales tax rebounded and has been beating uh, last year's totals. The, the you know, other taxes like the realty transfer taxes is, is doing really well. And so the, it, it's just been something that's played out completely opposite to the original projections. You can go to njspotlightnews.org for more on this story. With billions more federal dollars heading to New Jersey from the latest federal stimulus package, a state watchdog agency plans to make sure the money is properly spent. The Office of the State Controller has set up a new COVID-19 Compliance and Oversight Project, tasked with making sure the federal money is spent in accordance to guidelines. Acting State Controller Kevin Walsh told me how he's going to make sure the rules are followed and why he'll be on the lookout for possible fraud. Tell me how this oversight project is going to ensure accountability when it comes to these funds. We are ensuring that the funds are used in the right way by checking contracts that are proposed uh, to be entered into by state agencies um, when they're uh, proposing uses for recovery funds. We're also working to train uh, higher level state agency employees to ensure that uh, they understand what the funds can be used for. And then we are also uh, have a hotline where we do our best to collect complaints. We encourage complaints to come in regarding waste, fraud, and abuse so that uh, we can look into any allegations uh, of improper expenditures. And we're approaching this by looking at these issues on the front end through pre prevention and training, um, and then on the back end with detection of fraud, waste, and abuse, and where appropriate investigation and referrals. Now, we're talking billions of dollars. Do you have adequate manpower to get the work done? Uh, we do, and we're uh, in the process of hiring to increase that as well. In terms of the idea of fraud, is this something that you are going into this project overly worried about? 
Well, we know uh, whenever there are billions of dollars in response that, that the federal government has given to states throughout the country in response to national disaster, natural disasters or financial problems that have been experienced over the years, we know that there are always folks who will attempt to take advantage. Um, and so it's really important that the state have mechanisms in place to discourage fraud and also to detect and investigate fraud. Uh, and that's what we'll be doing here. Do you think those mechanisms are currently in place or do you have to help implement them at this point? So Governor Murphy entered uh, Executive Order 166 in July of last year. And since then, there have been enhanced mechanisms in place to prevent and detect fraud. And this is a lot of what government does day to day to begin with in, in all sorts of different programs. Um, but given the amount of funding and given the, the difficult and chaotic times that we're in right now, uh, it's especially appropriate to, to have an, an enhanced approach to this. And I think the federal government is justified in expecting states to do more given how much they're entrusting the states with in terms of recovery funds. What's going to be the biggest challenge for you and your team as you start work on this? I think one of the biggest challenges is the amount of funding, the number of state agencies that are involved, and uh, the creativity of folks who are trying to get one over on the state. We'll end it there. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Now we take a look at how the trading day wrapped up on Wall Street. Finally tonight, a reminder that an act of kindness can make all the difference. Some Rutgers Camden students came up with an idea to both honor local healthcare workers and help minority-owned restaurants. So they launched a plan and named it Hoagies for Heroes. Our Janine Donaldson picks up the story from here. We're just very, very thankful. Uh, you know, the impact that these, these young students have made uh, means a lot. A group of students from Rutgers University Camden is honoring, supporting, and uplifting those on the front lines of the pandemic, one sandwich at a time. Just to see a not only things opening up, but you know, reminding everybody that even though it's been a rough year and things are getting better and there's a light at the end of the tunnel, we still have to remember everything that our healthcare workers went through. You know, we still have to remember a lot of the, the struggles the businesses went through. And just to say, you know, we're here for you, we want to thank you, and just give back to the community. It's just it's it's a great feeling. Senior Areej Tariq says they raised around $2,400 and wanted to combine causes, helping struggling restaurants in the community to in turn support health care workers. We're very excited to be out here to finally see uh, Hoagies for Life, uh, Hoagies for Hero come to life. It was a virtual 5K event that we hosted and organized all together as a group. And, you know, we were thrilled with the response we got and the, the money we raised. So we used 100% of the proceeds to put it towards minority owned businesses in Camden, New Jersey, um, locally around us to serve about 300 hoagies and 400 uh, pastelios and empanadas to the healthcare workers, or as we call them, healthcare heroes at Cooper University Hospital. Cooper University says they're starting to see progress as the number of COVID cases decline. But for healthcare workers, it's been a long road to get here. It's really, uh, it, it makes us feel really great to see how the community has come out to support our healthcare workers. You know, it, it has been a very trying 14 months. And when you see students like this come out and support us, it, it just means a lot. Here we go. The students are a part of the business leader development program and were given the challenge of leaving their mark. The business leader development program actually has this every semester, but you know, we like to give them flexibility to do with it what they want. The program helps them to really learn the tools, the knowledge and gain the experiences to help them define how do I want to show up as a leader. So for this project, I gave them the challenge, leave your legacy what impact do you want to make as a leader? And from that, they created the 5K. It was Rutgers University professor Suzanne Critonek's first time seeing her students in person this semester and says they far exceeded her expectations. 
These students inspire me. Their passion, their determination, their vision to put this all together. They helped me to really see what was possible with it. I found that really energizing and inspiring. Altogether, 700 sandwiches were delivered to healthcare workers, but it was the appreciation that left the staff full. I'm Janine Donaldson for NJ Spotlight News. And that does it for us for now. But remember to catch Chatbox with senior correspondent David Cruz on Thursday. David looks at the confusion and the political divide over mask wearing from the CDC recommendations to the governor's mandates. That's Thursday at 6.30 p.m. live on our NJ Spotlight News YouTube channel. I'm Rob the Schaffler in for Brianna Venosi for the entire news team. Thanks for watching. We'll see you tomorrow. NJM Insurance Group, serving the insurance needs of residents and businesses for more than 100 years, and Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, an independent licensee of the Blue Cross and Blue Shield Association. Lead funding for Peril and Promise is provided by Dr. P. Roy Vagalos and Diana T. Vagalos. Major support is provided by the Mark Haas Foundation and Sue and Edgar Wachenheim III and the Cheryl and Philip Milstein family. Have some water. Look at these kids. How are you? What do you see? I see myself. I became an ESL teacher to give my students what I wanted when I came to this country. The opportunity to learn, to dream, to achieve, a chance to belong and to be an American. My name is Julia Toriani Crompton and I'm proud to be an NJEA member.